Okay, three, two, one. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Andrew Turner, founder and host of the GT Sessions podcast. And today we have an amazing guest, Mr. James Dodkins. Welcome, James. How's it going, man? It's going very good. I like, I like the, I like the, uh, the kind of the, is it Kiss? I don't know, Kiss and Rockstar kind of thing, isn't it? Just, it's, just the, uh, just the horns, mate. The it's the horns. It's the horns. Symbol. Yeah, the international symbol of heavy metal. Ah. So, so for anybody that's joining us from YouTube, you may notice that we have some amazing backgrounds on our session today. Obviously, you've got to guess who's got the authentic background. Is it James or is it Andrew? Send a postcard to, no, P.O. Box. No, not going to do that. So we have been a bit cheeky today, actually. So the actual official background is... Wait for it. Three, two, one. Mr. James Dodkins, you have the official guitar rock star background. You can prove it. it. And if I go back and I go like this and I go, oh, no, it's not. It's a picture. Oh, no. Anyway, so um, obviously I'm living the dream here, you know, meeting my very good friend, Mr. Dodkins, who actually is a rock star. So um, we met uh, a very a while ago. Because uh, my our very good mutual friend, Mr. Lord Towers, as we call him, Mr. Steve Towers, um, who is a um, customer experience rock god as well, like Mr. Yeah. Mr. But obviously not a rock star, he's a rock god. Um, he's like the um, what's the guy in um, in the uh, Marvel comics? He's like the he's not Thor. You're like Thor, and he's okay. like oh, he's like Odin, isn't he? He's like Odin, and you're like Thor, something like that. Okay, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after, we'd, after I'd done the, uh, my, my little Tesco escapade, uh, what I did was I did some work with Steve because he, he did, used to do some really good stuff and saw there's some good stuff today around his customer experience. And then, um, then Mr. Mr. Dodkins appeared on the scene. And, um, and I suppose, yeah, for the, for the audience today, maybe you could explain what you do. What, what, who is James Dodkins? What, do what gets you up in the morning? What do you do today? So... My name is James Dodkins. I used to be an actual, real-life, legitimate, award-winning rock star, but now I'm not. Now I'm a customer experience rock star. Basically, what that means is I talk about customer experience, but through the lens of rock music. So I talk to people about customer experience, but use music analogies and musical examples just to try and make it a little bit more interesting. I essentially only do three things. I do training. I do keynotes, which are musical, I play guitar in them, they're really cool, and I make a lot of video content. That's it, that's all I do. So you basically like, uh, you are living the dream of being a rock star, but actually you're not. Well, you, are you still officially a rock star? Are you still in the, are you still in the band or not? Well, that's an interesting topic. Uh, yes and no. So, the, the, the band from back in the day that I achieved a modicum of success with, no. That they are no longer. However, we okay. did have um, a, a reunion show not too long back. Actually, I say not too long back. It was like a year a year ago. No, yeah, uh, I can't remember when it was. Maybe about a year ago. Um, and it was, it was quite weird because the um, the bassist got in touch and said, "Jay, if um, if I can get the other lads to agree." Will you do like a reunion show, like a, a one last get? Because we, we kind of just fizzled for, out. For one night only kind of thing, yeah. Basically, yeah, it was, um, it was billed as the night they came home. <laughs> <laughs> like a hometown show. And I, I was like, yeah, sure. And I, di I didn't think it was ever going to happen, to be honest with you. I thought it was just all talk. And then next thing you know, we're in a WhatsApp group. Next thing I know, all the lads have agreed. Next thing I know, we've decided on a date. And I'm kind of like going through, it's like, oh, like, yeah, I know I said, yeah, but next thing I know, tickets are on sale. Three days later, sold out. Next thing I know, they oh, wow. the date, and then that sells out. So we ended up playing two sold-out reunion shows, um, and reunion slash farewell shows. And I was blown away, to be honest. I didn't think people still cared. I literally... Didn't. And how, how, many, how long was after that after you'd actually officially finished? About 10 years. Yeah, about 10, 10 years? years we, oh, yeah. wow. So that's amazing. I, well, yeah, I was amazed. <laughs> I didn't think, <laughs> literally didn't think anyone would care anymore. But I, I, I'm actually in a, a new band now. But this, it's all, okay. uh, it's all, it's all, it's all secret, shush. It's all hush hush. We should have been releasing some new music about now. 
you can probably guess why that hasn't happened. Mm. So, um, but we are we're working on trying to record remotely, which is quite interesting. Oh wow! Okay. Right so there, there you go. So I am still in a band, but no one's heard of it because it hasn't launched yet. Is this a new band? Yes. With Does it involve anybody that anybody else I know? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so it sounds like a future episode of the gnt session will be with the grand reveal maybe, maybe you maybe you'll give me an exclusive you know about you know andrew maybe, andrew we need, to, we need to do maybe you will okay maybe i will maybe i have to bribe you later okay so where are you, whereabouts are you in the world today then because i know obviously yes. everybody's been working working remote and working all over the world and traversing the world on zoom and yeah various other different um paraphernalia what, what where, whereabouts are you so i'm at the home studio in exotic birmingham so okay just just, just south of birmingham sully hall the nice bit that's the posh bit that's the posh bit man that's i tell you i've made it i've made it now i'm living in the posh bit of birmingham <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, I, I thought i'd just check because obviously your 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 accent is a bit of a giveaway you you, you know despite you you going to those elocution lessons you've still got that kind of that that kind of brummy, brummy, the brummy tone, the brummy, yeah. you know, the brummy, the brummy phrase, twang. The, the twang. Um, so when you say when you say customer experience, I mean, what for 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 people that are out there that may may they may have heard that word before. But what does it mean? What does it what does that what does customer experience mean to you? What what does it mean to the companies you work with? So in a business term, like customer experience, is the basically activities surrounding understanding and improving the relationships you have with your customers uh, mm -hmm. that's that's basically what it is it's, it's understanding the interactions you have with your customers the expectations they have the successful outcomes that they need to deliver uh, need, need to achieve the needs that they have it's working on understanding them and then improving the experiences that you give to those customers to deliver those things that's basically what it is and it's, it's and, and I know, I mean, that sounds simple, but obviously it's pretty complex to do that. So I, mean, I remember spending days and days and days with Steve working through that stuff. It's pretty involved. Isn't it? And I think there's a kind of, there's different methods and guidance and processes you have to do. It's pretty, it's pretty heavy. Because obviously when you think about all the ways that you could interact with a customer, especially now with technology, yeah. um, it's pretty, it's pretty complex. Is it, so what, what, who would be, I presume you've worked with some some quite interesting com companies over the years and some different in different industries I presume. It's kind of it's kind of cross industry issue I presume yeah I mean luckily it's pretty cool because pretty much every company in the world has customers so <laughs> I, can, I can work with that and it is to be fair it doesn't matter where you are in the world it doesn't matter what industry you're in customers only speak one language and that is experience and that happens to be a language that I am fluent in. I don't need to know anything about any particular industry. I don't really know anything about banking. I don't know anything about retail. But what I do know is customers, and that's where I can help people. And I've been super lucky that I've managed to work with some of the world's most recognizable brands. That's people like Disney. That's people like Lego. That's people like Adobe. That's uh, even brands like Nike. I've worked with governments all over the world. I've worked with airlines. I've worked with banks all over the world. And again, it's the one thing they all have in common is the fact that they have customers. And that's the only thing I need them to have in common. Mm. it's interesting yeah because it's, it's i mean i suppose and, and in this kind of um, current 2020 year that we're living in i presume actually it's even more important because obviously people customers are making choices about who do they continue to to you know to buy products and services from i suppose and that that differentiating point about how how much of a great experience they have and how they, they, they get looked after is obviously pretty critical i presume is that, is that what you're seeing as well yeah, hundred percent. It's like customers' expectations are changing so rapidly right now. I mean, don't get me wrong; they were changing quite rapidly before, but now they're changing even more rapidly. And mm. there's a this is going to be a make or break period of history for basically pretty much every company out there. Um, customers have got long memories, and if you're not there for them now, it's going to be difficult. Like, if as a company out there, if you can't be there for your customers in the bad times. Don't expect mm. them to be there for you in the good times. Mm, mm. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, it's interesting what you, you know, what you're doing. And obviously, the interesting thing, I suppose, what you, what I saw with with yourself when you brought your, I suppose, your personal brand together, is that you, you kind of, you did a mashup, yeah, because you had you had a history 
and I mean, we'll talk about the history in a second, but you've had a, quite a, a new a usual history before you got involved in customer experience. Um, so could you explain a bit about that? What, what's been your personal journey? Because obviously now you're seen as a, I suppose, a guru yeah, in this kind of area. I know you, you get, you're very well recognized globally. You, you work with people like, you know, these, these brands you mentioned. Obviously people don't, you know, brands like that don't work with people who are just learning how to do it. They work with the best people in the world. So, but you obviously, you're doing that now. But what, what was James before? How did, you, how did you get involved in this? What was your journey to here? Well, when I stopped doing the music thing, um, I did the logical next step. So after being an international rock god, logical next step, <laughs> go and work for an insurance company. So I did that. <laughs> and literally, it was no, I, I didn't have a big plan. It was just the closest big company to my house. So I was like, well, I'll just go and work for you guys. Started off selling insurance on the phone. Realized very quickly, you know what, I don't really want to be doing this forever. So set out to try and progress through the company. Now, I was really lucky because this particular company grew very quickly and I got loads of opportunities to progress, far more than I ever would have done if I would have joined like a massive company right away. So I worked my way through the company, ended up working all over the UK with loads of different types of companies because we administered insurance for loads of different companies. So I got to learn from loads of different industries. Right. Realized was, was it one of the big was it one of the big brands then or big institutions or was home serve, I can say their name it's home serve home serve okay yeah yeah okay right so um and this was this was before all, all the the trouble with them kicked off but you know what they they've recovered great from that they've done a wicked job um mm. but so so I learned a hell of a lot about lots of different industries mm. and how lots of different companies look at their customers uh, I found that I had a passion for training really enjoyed doing it because uh, to be honest with you for me training a group of people it's kind of just another version of being on a stage you know you get up in front of yeah. people and um, I've got a whopping ego on me I very much like standing up in front of people I, very I can tell you're very shy yeah I can tell you're very shy yes. um, I like the admiration of people so I, I sort of gravitated towards that um, was it, were they throwing the, throwing the clothes at you when you were doing the training sessions then? Is that what it was? Yeah. No, they were throwing more than clothes at me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Rocks and sticks. <laughs> no. Oh! Um, it was, no, it, it, was, it was nothing like that. But for me, it was just it was filling a little bit of a gap. And um, when, I, when I left that company, um, after getting a like, hell of a lot of experience there, I, I kind of looked back at my time there and said, well, when, when I was at this company, we had loads of really expensive, crappy consultants come through. I could be a really expensive, crappy consultant. So I did that. <laughs> so I became a really expensive, crappy consultant. Learned that, um, again, but more gravitated towards the training side of things. I don't really like consultancy. I'm not really very good at it, to be honest with you. And I don't like it. Um, too many politics. Things don't happen quick enough for my liking. And, um, yeah. But the, the, the thing but, is, but you like it sounds like you like you like the opportunity to kind of share your knowledge and, and, and help people to get on a, in a better place, you know, through your education and training. Is that is that kind of been a theme? Well, dude, the, the thing is, I've got two superpowers. Do you want to know what my superpowers are? You got two. Okay, you look at you. I'd love to know what your two superpowers are. You go on, hit me, so number, hit me with them. Number one, I'm incredibly lazy. <laughs> okay. That is my, that is my, the thing I'm most... That's quite an unusual one, but yeah, that's, he's starting, he's starting on the peak, yeah, go on. I've been blessed with unbelievable laziness. And what that means is, no matter what the task, no matter what the problem, I will find the easiest and quickest way to solve it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I don't like putting a lot of work into stuff. <laughs> so... Is, it, is, your, is your second superpower, I'm very, very honest? <laughs> no, um, maybe that's my third one. But the, my, my second one is that although I'm good at keeping other people's secrets, I'm really bad at keeping my own secrets, which I suppose kind of falls into that honesty thing. When I, when I find a quick and easy way to do something, I kind of just want to tell people about it. Um, probably comes back to a deep-seated um, you know, flaw in my own yeah. psyche that needs people to to be grateful for stuff that I've done. I don't know, but I just want to tell people about it. Like if I find a cool way to do something, I, just, I want to tell someone about it. So that is kind of what is. Oh, taken. so when you, when you find like a trick or a tip or a hack, then you want to share it basically. Well, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's, I mean, that's, that is a good superpower because you want to share basically. Yeah, can't okay. keep my own secrets. I'm lazy. Can't keep my own secrets. 
That's not bad. Well, you, 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 you share, you, you're sharing the love, aren't you? You're sharing the love. That's what you are. You, you're, you're a love. You're a, you're, a, you're a rock love god. That's what you are. You're a love god from rock, from the rock, rock and roll world. That's really weird, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird time at the moment. So you know, like we can be weird for a second. So, <laughs> so I mean, you, so just a quick question about your history. I know you, 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 so you touched on the segue from from rock star fame to, to customer experience rock star, yeah, which we'll come back to. But before that, so to get from where you were and you know, being young without a beard and a rock, a rock star hat, um, wh- how did you get to become a rock star? Because I mean, I, I'm, I'm intrigued. So this is the first episode, this is the first GNT Sessions episode in the history of the, of the show where we've had one, two, three, Six, six, twelve guitars on the on the show in one go. I mean, it's quite quite amazing. So you missed that one. There's one there. Oh, seven. So 14. Oh, 14. I can't even add up now. You see, I'm losing my, my losing marbles. So fourteen guitars. Um. So how? I mean, I I I I have a little personal story to share. So many many years ago, I actually bought two Gibson Les Pauls. One which was a slash replica. There was only two in the UK, and I bought one of the two, and I paid a, <clears throat> a lot of money for it. And then I unfortunately had to sell it, um, and I sold it for a lot of money, even more money. Anyway, I shipped it to the US uh, to a guy who had already got 38 Les Pauls. He was a bit of a collector. Exactly, yeah. yeah. He's like a bit of a collector. <laughs> that is a hell of a collector, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Chipped it in a crate from Heathrow. Um, and then I bought a cheaper one as well, a cheaper Slash replica, because Slash was my kind of uh, one of my, uh, what do you call it, younger self uh, guitar heroes, besides this guy called Steve Vai. You've probably heard of Steve Vai. Never heard of him. Come on. I'm from messing with you, of course, I've, course I've heard of Steve Vai. <laughs> one in the world that owns a guitar that hasn't heard of Steve Vai. You need to, you, you need to have your fingers amputated. <laughs> so I went, I went to see Steve Vai at um, Hammersmith Apollo, and I was late, for, unfortunately I was late to the traffic. And I got there, and I went to the front. It was the, it was on the, um, not not the not the kind of the what you call stalls. It was the first level up, and I went to the front. Of the, it was the front seat, right at the front, so I could get a really good view. Yeah. I went then, my seat had gone. So I said, I'm like looking at the ticket. I'm going, excuse me, mate. <laughs> you got sat in my seat. This guy had moved from the back of the hall to sit in my seat. Cause it was free, wow. but but literally there was such a funny story. I just got to tell you for a second. So his drummer had. Basically, like Billy Idol, and um, he had a so literally, you know, Steve Vai can make his guitar like talk, yeah, like he did with Yankee Rose with David Lee Roth, yeah. So he literally, there's this drummer comes on, and the drummer had got a whole drum kit ar- built around him, so it was like a mobile drum kit, and he's walking around the stage, and they were doing like a, a like um, you know, like a, you know, they do like this, and um. So then, he, then Steve played this lick, and I'm not kidding, it was like impossible. So this guy goes, I can't do that. And he goes, I've heard Britney Spears is looking for a new drummer. <laughs> so he basically, <laughs> so he played it. And um, it was absolutely brilliant story. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant story. So um, That's cool. The thing is, you say about Britney Spears and pop music and stuff, one of the best drummers in the world is a guy called Thomas Lang the Austrian drum machine. And okay. supposedly the way that he got so good hmm. was he was that ah, I'm sure someone can correct me on this story and I'm sure it's all factually wrong, but my version's good. <laughs> Apparently he um, was hired to tour with Pop Idol. You remember Pop Idol before? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, doing their, he was the live drummer on the Pop Idol tour. Ah, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. So basically he had to, play a bunch of these songs live mm. that were like written by drum machines like written oh, wow. by on computer fake drums and supposedly that's how he got so so good extra brilliant i mean he, he was already good or else he wouldn't have got hired to do the thing but apparently doing that like for months on end mm. was a, a really good thing playing stuff that is technically impossible to play because if you program drums like like we when we're demoing songs we program drums and then mm. you give them to an actual drummer they go you know that's not possible to play. i would have to have three <laughs> arms to we're like, whatever we it doesn't just do it 
Um, but yeah, so he did it. He managed to play things that were technically impossible to play. Wow, wow. Anyway, we, we digress a little bit because I know that I know I was I was trying to ask you a question one time, and then we oh, kind sorry. of I went off into my Steve Vai Steve Vai kind of uh, story. Um, who we we still I actually just another story of Steve Vai. I was actually contemplating going to New York to go and see him. You know, like you know that Steve Vai Academy he does. So I, 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 I vowed before I leave this earth that I will go to the Steve Vai Academy for a week and spend some time with him because he's brilliant. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Let me know. I'll come. Okay, deal. Um, so the um, so the segue yeah segue so I suppose your your uh, your story of you know from to get to become a rock star what what was that could you, could you, could you share that Cause that's, you know I'm quite interested in what how did you get to become a rock star of that so that, the, that status and that recognition the original band was just four kids that went to the same school that happened to like the same music that just wanted to play together. That's, that's where we came from. And um, there was a music room at school and lunch times we'd go in there and we'd play about. And I'm not a very good guitarist. So rather than learning other people's songs, I ended up just making up my own little song. <laughs> which, which then they would play along with. And then we'd, we'd be like, oh, we've just written a song. And that's kind of how it started. We started playing, writing songs properly. Um, playing little gigs and then we recorded a demo so a three track demo like in a real recording studio that like I know mm. like they, they don't exist very much anymore because everyone can make music from their computer like SoundCloud rappers is making yeah music but or we, from their like, iPhone or something yeah exactly yeah. yeah so we recorded this three track demo and we submitted it to a competition so there was a magazine called Metal Hammer, still exists if you've heard of it. It's like Kerrang and Metal Hammer were the two rock music magazines in the UK. And we submitted it because they ran like demo of the month competitions. Right. A couple of months later, we hear that we've actually won demo of the month in this magazine. And of course, we'd only been together for a really short, I think I must have been like 16 at the time still, maybe 15, 16. We won demo of the month. And then... So we got, we got quite a lot of publicity out of the, the magazine for that. Did a feature on us, et cetera, et cetera. Then, of course, because of that, you get invited to bigger gigs. You start, you know, you get more start touring with other bands and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. I don't think we toured by that point. Um, no, in fact, we definitely didn't tour by that point. Um, but we'd, we'd get invited to be opening acts for bigger bands and which, and then you get on bigger stages, you get in front of more people, then you get a bigger following. This was in the MySpace days. So we, we oh, had a, we okay, had a, MySpace. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, we had a massive following on MySpace, which is now useless. Um, <laughs> so, but then we found out. Like, I got a phone call from someone congratulating me, and I was like, "Thanks, man. What? What for?" He's like, "What haven't you seen?" And we'd actually won demo of the year in Metal Hammer. Oh really? Yeah. So wow. they took all of the demo of the month winners, and then put them against each other, and we won that. Which it's, like, it's like Battle of the Bands then, basically. It's Demo of the, demo, demo of the Year. Yeah. yeah, kind of. But basically, the, the, what they were saying is, out of all the demos that had been, out of all the thousands of demos that had been, been submitted, submitted. Mm. these are the guys to watch. These are the guys that are going to go somewhere. And of course, when a magazine endorses you like that, it, it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that kind and, of shot and what, us. Oh, and what was that magazine called? Metal, what was it, Metal, Metal Hammer? Hammer. You mean like hammer like that, hammer? Yeah. yeah. Anyone out there that's into like the more metal side of, of rock music, they will have heard of Metal Hammer magazine. Um, mm. so, so that happened. We got a lot, of, a lot more exposure because of that. Ended up in the magazine more regularly. Uh, we got a, an endorsement deal off the back of it. Um, then we ended up getting a record deal, a distribution deal for our first album. So uh, wrote and recorded our first, uh, to be fair, we already had all the songs written, but so recorded and released our first album, released my first album when I was 17. Uh, wow. And it like actually real life in the shops. You could literally the proudest moment in my life, other than getting married and having a kid. But other than that <laughs> stuff, was going into HMV, real life HMV and buying a copy of my own album. It was. Um, That's so cool, isn't it? Yeah. For, for a seventeen-year-old kid, that was just that was crazy. And just from then, we relentlessly toured, and oh, okay, and 
tried to promote ourselves any way that we could. And that kind of, yeah, it paid off. We had a modicum, of, we didn't make any bloody money from it, but we, we got a nice amount of notoriety. Uh, the, the way that people used to write about us, because we were young, they, they were kind of hailing us as like, he, like heavy metal saviors. I'm pretty sure that- Oh, really? Multiple okay. times from the UK. We were going to save the heavy metal UK scene. We didn't, because we split up. But that's what they thought was going to happen. But yeah, so did all that. Fun and what, what was? Are you allowed to tell the audience what who the band was? Or is that a yeah, speed, speed theory? Speed theory. Okay. All one word. Okay. So there you go. Um, so, you have to look it up. You have to, is, it, is it still? Is there still stuff out there on YouTube and things like that? Yeah, yeah. I think um, there's there's not that much on YouTube, which I'm kind of both happy and sad about because if there was. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be allowed to have this conversation anymore. Um, but I'm kind of sad because it wasn't, people didn't go to gigs and watch them through their phones. No, like, yeah, yeah. It, it was live. It was all live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It means there's not that much video footage of them. <clears throat> we actually commissioned ourselves at the time, which, which was a bit of a, bit of a shame. See, my, my, I think my, my, first, my first concert, I think, was 1983. I think it's right. It was '83. It was Iron Maiden mm. in in uh, the local polytechnic, and um, and then in no 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 I think it was '83. No no it was actually 1980. I went to see Rush uh, in Leeds Queens Hall and the Permanent Waves tour, um, and then I went to see Iron Maiden, and then I went to see quite a few like Michael Schenker, Saxon, Motorhead, you know all those you know UFO, all those Rainbow, Deep Purple. Etc. Yeah. Et so all the kind of, I suppose it wasn't. You wouldn't call it thrash metal. It wasn't metallic or anything like that. But it's more, you know, it's heavy metal, heavy yeah. rock, that kind of stuff. It's White Snake, all those kind of guys. So um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. I think it's a, it's a great thing to get to be involved in music. It's fantastic. Yeah. Interesting story about Iron Maiden. We were we were playing a gig in London, and we were we were the headliners, and there were some bands supporting us, and. Um, after everyone had finished, this lad came up, um, so sort of knocked, knocked on our door and came in and was speaking. It was like, oh, really enjoyed your set. Thanks, thanks for letting us play on your gig. And we were like, oh, you played a great show, blah, blah, blah. And just doing the niceties. And um, Wes, our singer, he had, he had this like steam inhalation kit because when you're doing like a big run of shows, you got to look after your voice, etc. cetera. Mm. Guitarist, don't, as long as you don't break your fingers, you're fine. Whereas a vocalist, you gotta, you got to do things. And, and the, the lad said, oh, what's that? And Wes explained, he said, it's a steam inhalation thing. It helps with the throat. And he went, oh, yeah, I know. My, my dad's got a room for that. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, yeah, for his, for his, he's got like a steam room for his, for his voice. And we were like, what are you, like, okay, what are you talking oh, about? Bruce, Bruce Dickinson's dad, was it? Yeah, he, yeah was Bruce it? Dickinson's son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Austin. Wow. And people like it. Because he said, oh, yeah, my dad plays in a band. You, you, you've probably heard of him, Iron Maiden. And, and our bassist almost passed out. <laughs> I'm the biggest Iron Maiden fan. He was like, I've got this Eddie tattoo on my arm. He was like, if I didn't have anything better going on in my life, I'd get an Eddie tattoo on my face. And we were like, calm, calm down, man. Um, like, literally, <laughs> literally said that to him. And, and we, we became good friends with him and we played with him loads of times and he, he's been in multiple bands since and we've always ended up on the same shows playing together. And yeah, it, it, was, it was just a weird coincidence. We got invited to his birthday party. Oh, did you? Okay, fantastic. So we, we didn't end up going, actually. We, but he, but he's, cap, he's cap, is it Captain Dickinson now? Because he's actually an easy jet, I think he's been an easy jet pilot, hasn't he, I think? No, he has been. I don't, I don't know if it's like, a, I don't, well, he's got his own plane and he flies planes and flies people. There's a thing you can do where you can like book. AD1 AD or whatever it is. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you can be flown by him over to a place, do a gig and then be flown back, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there you go. That's, that's my, out of everything I've ever done, that's my claim to fame. <laughs> Yeah, but, but it's interesting because you see what you've done there. I mean, that's that's. I mean, it's such an amazing story, and, and for you to get to that stage, you know, so early in your life, yeah, and then actually for you to people call it pivot, yeah. So they kind of yeah. you then you then got to that stage, and then obviously it sounds like the band didn't quite continue for whatever reason, but we'd have to go through that. But 
but then you you then you then evolved into into something completely different yeah we're doing the stuff around the insurance thing and your your stuff now with customer experience and then but then you've actually then combined it together which i think is, is genius yeah so thank you um the thing is i didn't immediately do the rock star thing I'd, cr I'd created this corporate persona for myself the way that i thought you had to be you should you be look, yeah. yeah in business and the problem was it worked and so i carried on doing it but i was miserable because mm. i was really careful about what i said and how i said it and how i acted the entire time mm. and it just it, it wasn't me i wasn't being myself like there was not a single time in my corporate life where i felt like i could be myself mm. and Various things happened, uh, but the, the one thing that sort of changed my thinking about all of this was a, a quote from Jerry Garcia from Grateful Dead. Yes. It's, don't try and be the best in the world at what you do. Be the only person in the world that does what you do. It kind of all hit me at once. I was like, you know what? I've got this, this, this history that most people would kill to have been part yeah, of. Yeah, exactly. Um, I never tell anyone about that. I keep as like my dirty little secret. Mm. And the customer experience space is getting quite dry and quite, quite saturated. Mm. Why not put them together? Why not make myself stand out? Why not talk about customer experience in a more engaging and fun way? So I, I spoke to my wife about it. She was two months pregnant at the time. I said, right, I've got this idea. She's like, okay, tell me. So it's going to you know, really progress the business. It's going to take us to the next level. She's like, okay, what? I'm just going to be myself. <laughs> He was like, oh. Are you sure? Are you sure, James? Yeah. yeah. I don't, don't really like you being yourself around the house, let alone... You know, <laughs> no, no she, didn't, she didn't say that. Um, but she was like, okay, give it a try. Let's do it. Um, and luckily, it's, it's, it's paid off. But it was, it was a big risk because I couldn't... Weirdly, so I, did, um, I was in Iceland not too long back doing this sort of stuff. And I got interviewed for a newspaper out there. And one of the guys sent me a picture of the front, the, it wasn't the front cover, like the, the big spread in the newspaper. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And I posted it online. I was like, look, I don't really know what it says, but I've been in the newspaper. They interviewed it for me, but they wrote it in Icelandic, of course. Mm. I was like, I don't know what this says, but it's cool because I'm in a newspaper. And uh, somebody translated it for me. And it was like, it said, Rockstar comes out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? And it, so it turns out it was, um, it must have just been a translation thing. But since then, I've referred to it as coming out the closet. Since I came out the closet as a rock star, there's no going back in. I can't just now just be like, uh, can you forget about all that rock star stuff? And I'll put a tie on and pretend that I'm, like, I'm, I'm out now. I'm, I'm out and no, proud. But, no, but, but that's, that's the best thing you see. What, but what said, that sounds like is that you came to a, an, like an epiphany moment. You came to a, a, you know, a mindset thing where you, you said, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hide behind the mask. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be authentic. I'm gonna be real, and um, you know what what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? You, but you see, I suppose it's the thing is you went through a journey because it sounds like you you thought that you had to be like a certain person or behave in a certain way, be yeah. be a certain way to to fit in. But actually, you know, if you think about it, now you stand out. You know, people who you know you are as far as I can I, I know, you are the only rock star experience guru in the whole world. Is that right? Exactly. So I wasn't trying to be in the best in the world of what I did. I became the only person in the world that does what I did. Exactly. So, um, I mean, there are some imitators. That's fine. But um, they're never, never going to be me. But the thing is, it's like you get bombarded all the time. Like, you need to be unique. You need a unique spin on what you do. Turns out the easiest way to be unique is to just be yourself because mm. there, like, there is only one of you. There is only one person with your personality and your traits so if you want to be unique all you got to do is just be yourself i wish i would have figured that out sooner to be honest with you <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly because it's quite right. simple really but yeah so um so in terms of i mean your journey so one of the things i talk about is kind of peaks and valleys yeah so obviously you've talked about some some amazing peaks you know like you're going into hmv getting that, that your first album if you were going to share with the audience some some valleys are you things that you you hoped would go a certain way and then it went a slightly different way and you and you learned from that. Is there anything you can share that you, you think would be valuable for people to listen to? Well, the, the life of a musician is basically just an entire valley with a right. few that... It, it's basically constant misery and disappointment sprinkled with the odd occasion of 
brilliant stuff. That Relation. Do you, play yeah. do you play golf? Sorry? you play golf? I, ha I did do before my sons came along, yeah. yeah so it's like golf. Like Most of it is awful and you hate every second of it. But then every now and again, you do a really good shot. <laughs> like, ooh. And, that, and that's what keeps you coming back. It keeps you coming back because you think, ah, but what if... You get, you, get, you, get, like you, get a, you get a par three or you get a hole in one and you think you, you're like uh, Tony yeah. Jacqueline or whoever. Yeah, it's like every... You think, well, what if every hole was like that one? What if every shot was like that one? And that's the thing that keeps coming back, where it's like that in music. Most of the time, it's awful. But every now and again, there's a really cool thing that happens, and that's the thing that... I say that, I'm being quite... I'm, I'm being quite pessimistic with that. I'm sure it's, it's not like that for everybody. It's just basically when you are starting out and when you are in a in a kind of niche world, mm. you do get a hell of a lot of disappointment. And you learn to deal with it. You learn to the way you deal with it is you learn to not get your hopes up, which is kind of sad. Um, but the, the the biggest disappointment was the the big. It was kind of the biggest catalyst for us stopping doing what what we were doing. And okay. It was, so we've become used to not getting our hopes up, not raising our expectations, never getting excited about anything until, you know, the ink was dry on the contract. Yeah. Um, but then we got offered a tour with probably at the time who, who was the biggest band in heavy metal at the time, like biggest mainstream band, other than like the Black Sabbaths and the Metallicas, like the, the biggest mainstream metal band at the time. And, and who was happened, that? which one was that? A band called Machine Head. Yeah, machine head. Yeah, 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 another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Heard of them. And without going into too many of the details, what had happened was there. Weirdly enough, one of my friends is the drummer for Machine Head now, which is I'm not jealous of at all. But anyway, <laughs> um, if Matt, if you're listening, hit me up with some free tickets. Um, <laughs> but, so there, the opening band from their European tour dropped out. Uh, the singer got ill and we got offered the tour basically we got told like asked would you want to fill the spot and we were like whoa okay look like a massive european tour with arguably the biggest heavy metal band in the mainstream heavy metal world right now mm. that's going to be the th the thing that solidifies us the pinnacle yeah, yeah yeah i mean don't get me wrong like the pinnacle would have been to bin them but we were still on our journey but that ooh been... ooh <laughs> But that would have been the, like, you know, a really good stepping stone to, yeah, to get there. Yeah, exactly. And the, the deal is, and a lot of people don't know this about the music industry, especially when it comes to bands, you have to buy onto tours. Oh, do you? So, All right. Yeah. So it's a pay, pay to play. Basically, yeah. Uh, you still need to be offered it in the first place. It's not just that anybody can do it. You still need mm. to be in the running and have half decent music then again we did talk with some people who had some really awful music so maybe anyway um <laughs> and it, it was going to cost a lot of money i'm not going to go into details but it was going to cost a ridiculous amount of money and our label couldn't cover it all um right so we were going to have to find it but then you would get i presume then you would get a percentage of the ticket sales is that how it works i would assume that but no you'd, you'd make your money back from merch or at least you would really try yeah oh well yeah. Yeah, as, that's, as a, that's, a, that's a lot. That's a lot of black t-shirts and hoodies. Yes, and armbands. It, it yeah. would have been the so yeah. Like as as a touring band, unless you are the headline and getting paid for it, or or if you're like close to the headline and you're going to be bringing in a lot of people yourself, mm. you don't get you don't get a cut of the door. Whereas the the lower bands make their money back from merch, and we were sensible. Right. We always kept all of our merch rights. We never gave that away because it's the like if if we sold um c d in h m v like yeah. I personally would make fifty p from it All right so you sell like a twelve twelve pound album i would say that's and you make wow i make fifty p so it's like h m v will take their cut the distributors will take the cut the record label will take the cut the management mm. will take the cut and then you're left with what and you've got to split that out between four people in the band so it's just you even though you are the person that creates the music you end up with the, the smallest amount of the but anyway um but the, the thing that you do make money on is merch you can right. get a t-shirt printed for a couple of quid sell it for a tenner 
big margins in that mm. court and people like buying merch so merch is a, a great way to do it and I've, I've carried that through you can see my merch you can go to yeah i did notice you were on brand there go to www.cxrockstore.com and you can buy all sorts of customer experience you heard merch. it here first cxrockstore.com please yeah. go there and spend lots of money on the online store available nice 24 by 7 to be fair, I've got to be honest with you, there's no margin in that whatsoever because it's all print on demand because I didn't <laughs> want to buy like a thousand hats. So I make very little of that. But it's cool because people like to buy the T-shirts and wear them and that's nice. But anyway, what, the, what was I talking about? Right, the, the machine head thing. Um, and we'd, we were kind of trying to figure out how we were going to get the money together. And um, basically, long story short, it fell apart and we didn't end up going on the tour. And... Um, it was just it was just one disappointment too much. I think what we had done, all of the excitement that we suppressed for everything else ever came out in this one. We allowed ourselves to get excited for this. Right. And um, we shouldn't have. Well, and then it didn't it didn't happen then basically, so the funding yeah, for it. Didn't it. Happen. Yeah, it crushed us. And just after that we just it's Well, you just thought you'd give up basically after that, or is it just essentially yeah. we, we never sat down and agreed on it we just mm. slowly stopped doing stuff um, yeah see what you need to do so you need to you know given you've got this rock star brand yeah you know i mean one of the one of the most most my most favorite videos you probably you, you probably know as well is the nickelback one you know with ted nugent in it and all the various other characters that are in it you know the the top and stuff. yeah yeah maybe we should do it maybe we should do a brummy version of that Maybe I should. You, know, you can be you can be in the bull ring center, you know. I know it's posh now. You know, you could do all the different bits around, you know, rather than around Hollywood in the Playboy Mansion. You could do like bits around, you know, Sully Hall. Or I could, yeah, I could do, <laughs> I could do the bull ring in Birmingham. What else is famous in Birmingham? That's about it, really. Who, which famous people? So you got Ozzy Osbourne, famous Brummie, Lenny Henry, <laughs> <laughs> Jasper Carrot. Who else is famous from Birmingham? Well, I mean, I guess. Yeah, but, you know, but you know, but you know, because they do the they do the lyrics over the over the yeah. track. You could do like all these shots from you know Jasper Carrot, you know Lenny Henry, Ozzy, you know from his mansion in Beverly Hills or whatever. You know, I think it'd be a you you get a few million hits on YouTube for that. Yeah, there you go. You heard it here first. You know, Andrew's Andrew getting creative with James on on the GNC session podcast. There you go. Love it. I'm not giving you so, a cut. You're not. Come on. No, it's because I'm, it's I'm not going to do it, if I'm being honest with you. Oh, okay. But remember never, what never, say, never, never say never, never say never, never say never, Mr. Dawkins. Yeah, never but remember never. my superpower with the fact that I'm incredibly lazy. That sounds like a hell of a lot. So, um, so we talked about the G. We talked about a bit about your personal journey. We talked about your, your bit about your business journey. We'll come back to that. Um, that on the T stands for? Oh, growth. So that's what it sounds about growth. Oh, I was going to say what G stands for journey. You're taking liberties there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a stretch that one, wasn't it? So no, so we're talking about your growth journey, your growth journey from being, you know, teenage rock star, rock god to um to slightly older rock god, but customer experience god. Um so yeah, so on the on the T side, uh the technology side, so you know, what one of the things we've had to obviously guess on the on the show who, you know, spent pretty much all their life they've been an engineer. And then they, you know, stayed in tech. That you know, Jackie Taylor, who's on the show the other week, she, she was one of the first um, female engineers that that helped set up Tech City in London, um, which is now Tech Nation in the UK, um, and she's now advising the United Nations on 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 technology as an advisor. But you know, obviously, yeah, so I suppose you know, talking about the technology part of you know, do you, do you, you know, are you technology aware are you technology conversant you know do you just use technology for what you do as your job how how does tech feature in your world in the I, i'm a, i'm aware that it exists mm -hmm. um i don't know what the second word you said means Con right conversant well no i mean so, so what i'm saying is conversant so so some people we've had on the show well, some of the people in the show you know would, would basically build tech yeah so they would build products the technology products they would you know, build software, yeah? Some people actually just use technology for their, the things they do in their daily lives, for their, da you know, their daily jobs, yeah? And then some people are, 
obviously have a, an impact on the future of tech. Yeah. So I suppose it's working out where where you would sit on those kind of three different camps. It sounds like the middle middle one. Yeah, I mean, poss possibly into the, the future one, because I do I do talk about technology a lot in customer experience, but I talk mm. about it in a way that a lot of technologists don't really like. What okay. I say is that technology should never drive customer experience. It should always be mm. driven by it. You should always understand the ideal experience that you need to deliver and then go to technology last. Don't start by looking at the technology. Mm. Say, no, well, what could we do with this? Start by looking at your customer, understand what it is you need to actually do, and then figure out how technology can help you do it. The, the way I think, the, the thing is, I am not, I don't understand technology at all. It's like, but I love it. It's like my wife, I love her, but I don't really understand her. It's, it's, that's my relationship with technology. Absolutely love it. And I'm so fascinated with the new things it can do and stuff that's going to be in the future. But how does it work? Well, I don't know. Magic, I guess. That's the, the, the Arthur C. Clarke thing, isn't it? Any fo sufficiently advanced form of technology is indistinguishable from magic. I'm, I'm that kid in the magician <laughs> going, oh, wow, that's cool. So, yeah, I don't know how it works, but I'm glad that it does. No, but you, make, but you raise a valid point. So I've, I've seen lots of businesses as well, get, they get kind of lost in the, in the tech side of it. And then... They say, oh, we've got this super duper bell and whistle, this feature function or whatever, this, this feature that's like, you know, going to save, so, you know, do something. Let's build, build the whole customer experience around that feature, around that particular technology capability. And then you become dependent on it. Yeah. yeah. So you know, what you're saying is, look, it sounds like you're saying is look through the customer's eyes. What is the customer journey that people should be expecting from the brand? Yeah. yeah? They, have a, they, have a, they have a brand promise that they want to deliver through the customer experience. And I presume that's what you say is that's the better way to chart how you define what your customer experience is rather than saying we've got the latest wing widget or the latest, you know, wing bang woozle or whatever it is that we yeah. should, we should actually use, you know, do, do let technology drive the customer experience because you could get into trouble. Is that, is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. So it's like, I mean, pers personal story about this recently, I had to put my training online because mm. I had to go and do it in person so what a lot of people would do is they would look at what platforms are available first and say okay there's udemy there's teachable there's this there's that the other they would find out what their capabilities are they would understand that understand how the system works and then they would create the training to fit into that mm -hmm. i did it the other way around i created the training the way it needed to be and mm -hmm. then found the platform that was going to help that happen right and it's and again you you don't have to know anything about technology to be able to do that that's that's what technology people exist for that's why they're so great um you, you can go to them and say look i need i need something that can make these things happen mm. please help me do that rather than starting with the technology and going hey what's technically possible in the world of technology and what's cool and what features can we put in and then taking it and going oh how do we cram this into people's lives now because i'm sure if i would have first looked at the technology i would have found loads of cool little like little like, shiny cool, shiny shiny things yeah, shiny yeah. things like oh you could do a pop-up questionnaire at this point or you could do a thing there and i would be like oh i want to use that oh i want to use that but then i would have ended up creating the training to fit that to fit the capabilities that existed mm. just because it existed just because mm. i wanted to use it just because it was cool whereas doing it the other way around it forced me to find a plat the platform i ended up using has got less bells and whistles than anything else but it does what i need it to exceptionally well so right. yeah and which which one did you pick by the way cartra i don't know if you've come across cartra before cartra is a great piece of um kit because it's it's going to be taken over my email software as well so i for technology people out there i use something called infusionsoft for yeah email. i'm gonna say if there's anyone from infusionsoft listening i'm gonna be cancelling you soon mate because cartra has got me covered uh the, the nice thing about infusionsoft and why i liked it is you can set up sort of process flows based on behaviors so if they click this thing you then send them that thing if they don't click it within so this like thing, different different personas and different different journeys yeah based on behaviors so you know mm -hmm. if you open a thing and watch a video 
I know about that, I can tag you, and then that means I can send you another one. If you don't open mm. it, it means I can send you um, a nudge email to say, hey, you didn't. Watch, I know you didn't watch this, you should watch it. Mm. And mm. that's why I, I got engaged with Infusionsoft, because you can build some really... Um, intelligent, personal, intelligent flows, personalised flows, yeah. Yeah, unique experiences for the people that are going through your stuff. Kasha does that, and it costs less, and I get the training platform in there, and I get payment gateways, and I, get, I just get everything all in that. It's wicked. So, see you later, Infusionsoft. Okay. It's not called Infusionsoft anymore. It's called Keep. It's got, yeah. Which obviously you're not. You're not going to keep. Sounds like. Ah. <laughs> boom, boom. That backfired. Yeah. Um. So no, that's, that's interesting. So, so it sounds. Uh, that's, that's a good, good takeaway from uh, the use of technology. So, in the context of the future of technology, have you got any any particular perceptions on that? What, what's your view on? What you see as the future of technology? Anything that you see that's good? Anything that you see that's concerning? I mean, obviously, there's been some interesting events that happened in the last, you know, a few months to do with technology, um, and um, obviously the whole thing that whatever happens in the world now seems to really seems to know about it in a nanosecond, um, which is either good or not so good. It depends if what you've done is good or not good. I guess the. Um... The, when it comes to the future of technology, I don't, I don't really know. However, I am fascinated. I cannot wait to see what things are going to look like. So much so that if I had it my way, right, this is my plan, right, this is my retirement plan. Do you want to hear my retirement plan? Yeah, you, you're quite well, way off it, but yeah, go on, tell me. When I'm old enough, that I'm still active, but kind of getting to the point where I'm like, ah, I'm old and life's boring now. What I'm going to do <laughs> I'm going to proactively cryogenically freeze myself. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen is every 100 years, I'm going to get bought back for a week. <laughs> and in that week, people are going to, you know, show me the technological advancements that have happened. They're going to give me a rundown of all the cool things, show me all the cool cars that have been created, all the cool new technology in that week. And I'll learn about it. And then I'll go back to sleep for a hundred years. And then the next hundred years, I'll get woken up for a <laughs> That's just going to carry on forever. My wife's, I've told, I've told this plan to my wife. This is what I want to do. And she said, wouldn't you be lonely without your friends and family? I wouldn't be lonely. I'd be famous. I'd be the hundred year cryogenic frozen. You'd be the, yeah, you'd be the 10,000, 10,000 year old man. Yeah. Exactly. I'd be, I'd have loads of the friends. Ten, the 10,000 year old rock star. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I mean, I might have left that gimmick behind by then, but no, see, I would, I would actually really like that. To, and I know it sounds weird, but I'd love that to happen. If every hundred years I could just be bought back for a week and then, um, I learn about, we well, see what, you know, I think this could be, this could be, this, it sounds like it's going to be the, the theme of a future film. I mean, you know, obviously when we post this video in the future, this interview on or this episode on, on YouTube, then you know the bots, you know, the bots will, 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 you know, will transcript it. They'll, they'll, they'll identify that who you are. They'll take a picture of it. They'll send you to all, your face to all the studios. You'll go, look, this is the guy. This is the guy we need to get in that next high-tech sci-fi film. Talking about the, you know, what's it called? What do you, what do you, what do you call you're going to do to it? You're going to be frozen. Yeah, I think you can, you can be, that's a great you, name for the movie. Yeah. Let's call it Frozen. <laughs> you, could, you could call it the Frozen Rockstar. There you go. I just think Frozen sounds catchier. I don't know why there isn't a movie called That's great. Just you get, get Frozen. You, you, you're gonna be the, it's going to be an, an animation version of you. That could be quite scary. Maybe. Um, so, um, so one of the things I think, so I think from, from, from an audience point of view, one of the things I think you pulled off really, really interestingly is, is what I would call branding, your personal brand. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you, you, you talked about it a bit earlier in the episode about the combining your your superpowers combining, you know, you, I know you've got some interesting superpowers, but also the combining your, your actual personal experience then with, with, with some skills that you brought that you're then using to teach other people really good skills as well. Yeah. So is there any, is there any things that you would, what, what, what have you been learning around that? What's been the growth story around that? What have you learned about personal branding? Have you, have you got any thoughts around that? I've learned that it's pretty bloody important because the thing is, there's a lot of people out there that don't remember my name, but they'll remember, oh, you're that rock star guy. The amount of people that come up to me at conferences and events, go, oh, you're, you're that rock star guy, aren't you? So my, my number one tip would be get a gimmick. And it, mm. it, it sounds not nice to call it a gimmick, but it is a gimmick. It's my gimmick. It is a thing that helps mm. me stand out and gets remembered. Um, it's like in the, in the wrestling world, I don't know if you're into wrestling, like the whole WWE stuff. 
a wrestler's persona is called a gimmick. It's their gimmick. Right. So like the Undertaker, his gimmick is that he's actually dead and he buries people. There you go. Stone it's, like, it's, like the rock. it's like The Rock and stuff like that, isn't it? I suppose. Like Dwayne yeah. Johnson. And everyone's got their, their own gimmick. And I think mm. you, it's, a, it's a good idea because it gets you remembered. Um, mm. Just if, if a wrestler came out, standard, had no distinctive qualities at all, had nothing to remember them by, they, would, they wouldn't be very good at all. Mm. Whereas if you've got a gimmick, the good gimmicks get remembered and get picked up on. The bad ones sort of get thrown away. But I, I think everyone, if you are looking for personal branding, get a gimmick, get that thing, get that hook, get that thing that's going to get you noticed, it's going to make you stand out and the thing that's going to get you remembered. For me, it's the rock star thing. I talk about delivering rock star customer experience. I call myself a, a customer experience rock star. If mm. you've got any, anything, I, I think it is good if you can actually relate to it yourself. If yeah. you actually have personal experience of it because of that whole authenticity thing. I suppose you yeah. don't have to. Um, it's not the, like there's, there's people out there that are, insert industry ninja insert industry <laughs> king or the queen of whatever P people do that but again it gets them remembered it gets them noticed uh I, I think it is better if you've got some personal connection to the thing that you actually you know you give it's also the is, is, is the thing also also is that with that you you, you know that's got a phrase you call social proof yeah so if you know if presume if, if somebody's searched on google these days and Typed in customer experience rock star. I presume it would there would be a lot of stuff out there, content information, stuff you've done before Let's that do actually. It. I don't know. I've never googled it. Customer experience rock star. Um, so there's somebody that's hijacked it and put an advert. Okay, screw you. There's my website. <laughs> So my company website, Rockstar CX, is my personal website. There's my LinkedIn. There's an interview with me. There's a bunch of videos from me. It's basically all me. So oh no, actually no, there isn't. There's one from Rockstar Games. Oh, um, Rockstar Games. Yeah, 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 yeah. About their, talking about their customer experience department. But other than that, it's all me. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, you I see that, 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 that's the thing you see. You know, you know what Google does. You know what Google does. Google rewards content. It rewards the actual stuff you put out there yeah oh, um, so obviously that's what it's doing because you you are the customer experience rock star yeah well that's that's the thing i mean don't get me wrong i don't think very many people are going to be searching for customer experience rock star it's not something that people would search for i imagine but it just shows that i am the only one in the world because when you type it in the entire first page other than that advert and the rockstar games thing just all me probably 10 pages in is probably all me as well um, because I'm the only one. So, 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 so if you think about lessons then for, for the personal branding that you're saying, find that gimmick, find that hook, find that uniqueness that you can own and you can be the, the person behind that, 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 mm -hmm. that concept, I suppose, that, that, um, that hook. So yeah. Are there any, any, any other things you've learned on your personal journey of, of what you've been doing around personal branding? Content and the nice thing is once you've got the the gimmick content is easier to write because You, you want to put all of your content through that lens if you can now I, I don't put all of my lens through like a music all of my content through a musical lens um, mm. it's, it's, it's impossible to try and have some music analogy for every single thing I want to talk about um, But it is good and it does give you jumping off points when you do want to write content or when you want to create videos or whatever so it, Creating content is massive right now. Again, you, you're saying there with the Google thing, they reward you for content. For me, the thing that really elevated what I was doing and got me to really to the place that I'm at today was content. If it wasn't for content, nobody would have known who I was. Nobody would have known my thoughts around customer experience. Nobody would have known, um, you know, my presentation style and my persona and my charisma they wouldn't have known that so for me it's all about content man mm. Get a well, you, you, your personality your personality and your magnetism yeah i mean like you, you know you are an entertaining individual so you know thank you oh stop complimenting me he says um yeah, yeah i'm gonna I'm really, i'll be throwing my underwear at you next um Thanks. not um so so I suppose, yeah, so in terms of um, 
kind of suppose finishing off the, the if you you know it's kind of suppose it, you, you kind of give me some lessons here as well already aren't you so people that actually should be thinking about the the growth journey that you've been through is some of the takeaways around what you would be sharing with you if you, you know to your younger self and what you would be sharing about things that people need to think about i mean do you believe personal brand and the, the things you just mentioned about is is that important to everybody or is it just important to certain people or is it, is it kind of is it is it ubiquitous should, should everybody everybody be thinking about how they build their own personal brand is that, is that becoming more and more important or I don't, I don't actually know to be honest with you it's not really something i've given much thought to i think like knee-jerk reaction is probably no not everybody needs to worry about their personal brand i think if you are like an independent person out there doing consulting or training or whatever then yeah you probably do need to care about your personal brand if you're an author if, you, if you're somebody that you know gets paid based on their influence at the end mm. of the day then yeah you really need to if, you, if you're just working in a grocery store behind the tills maybe you don't need to worry about your personal brand it's not i don't know i don't think so it's a tough one because a personal brand can do wonders for your career Mm. Well, in all in all honesty, the decision I made with the whole rock star thing has probably made me unemployable. Right. I think, well, if I ever okay. wanted to just jack this in and get a, just a sweet little office job somewhere doing customer experience, look, I think I would find it very difficult now. So it's a double-edged sword mm. uh, because... But then, it, but then it's about picking the, the area that because the area that you picked is such an important strategic imperative for every single company in the world. Who would who doesn't want to have a legendary customer experience? Yeah, me me working in corporates, me working in startups now, me working with different different brands across the world. Everybody should if you if you're the CEO, you're in the kind of the leadership team. You should be thinking about what what is that interaction from the first contact right through to whatever happens you know, down, down the customer journey and you know, the lifetime experience is yeah. absolutely imperative. So for somebody who's not thinking about that, so I think because you picked such an important topic and you're making it interesting, yeah, because you, you're bringing that character, that personality to it, then, you know, would you ever go back to a, you know, a, you could say a traditional job. I don't think you ever would do anyway. I don't, well, I don't think I'd ever be given the opportunity to, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it would have to be something, pretty it would have to be a good offer if mm. that makes sense for me to you never know you see you never go you met machine met machine head right might might call you up and say we've got a space for the lead guitarist see there you go i'd have to get oh, a lot better ozzy Os, ozzy osborne you know with the you know we like to think about that you know ozzy osborne you know brummies together you know I mean that, yeah, maybe. I need, I, need, I, need, I need a brummy. I need a brummy, a brummy lead guitarist. You know, that's called James. I mean, if if to be fair, out of all of the people in Birmingham named James, I'm still probably not even in the top 100 good guitar. <laughs> I'm not a very good guitarist, man. I'm, I'm slightly above average. Um, you shattered my illusion. Now I thought you were brilliant. I thought you were like you know. I'm, I'm all right. Be better than the other <laughs> person off the street. You're better than you're better than me. You're better than me. Look, so, we, so in the future, you see, we're going to be both at the Steve Vai Academy, you know, riff, yeah. riff, doing the riff, yeah? Doing the... Doing the, the, riff, like, the random person on the street, you take a random person off the street, chances are I'm better than him. You take a professional guitarist, I'm like, I'd put money against myself every single time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm just going to say that in the future, I, I hope to have a, such a such an amazing guitar collection like you've got and obviously then I can actually have my ability to actually re reach back and go Bing! you know with my own, my own guitar Ding. so um, I was just gonna say mr. mr. Dobkins uh, it's been very very nice lovely episode with you thank you so much for coming on the episode today Thank um, you. that was mr. James Dobkins customer experience rock star and if anybody wants to get hold of you um and, and and have some amazing insights and help and support and uh pearls of wisdom how how would they get hold of you what's the best way of getting hold of you james so social media wise linkedin 
is is the best way that's where i post most stuff um but if you want to check out my musical keynotes and my new virtual musical keynote go to jamesdodkins.com if you are an event organizer that is among the many right now that are just pulling their hair out trying to put on a fun and engaging event and don't want a boring webinar style one where someone's muted for half the time they just trying like bar charts and crap and check me out because it's going to be fun and exciting and different and visually impressive oh. Have you got? I was going to say actually before you before you finish. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. By the way, have you um, have you actually got like uh, disco balls? You know, maybe not disco balls, but maybe lights and you know and like dry ice and stuff like that that you can can do from your from your house, or is that is that well, being banned by the wire? I mean, I do have I do have studio lights, but they 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 don't do different colours. <laughs> I do actually I do actually have a smoke machine. Probably not going to use it no I'm, I'm not suggesting you put the smoke machine on now because we would actually lose you off the video but yeah i'm thinking now could i use it you know <laughs> I'm, I'm, no let's, let's not go there so i was just gonna say thank you thank you so much for coming on the episode today at james um this was james dobkins uh consumer experience rockstar and i think you heard james.com and let's catch up soon and let's, you know, what is it? It's like, you're like that, don't you? it's like my fingers, my fingers dropped off. There you go. You got it. Oh, is it, it's like that, is it? It's like that. Yeah. Either, either way. I broke, I broke my finger. Yeah. I broke my finger. Yeah. See, I've got a weird Drop. little finger. It's it <laughs> kind of like Ben's, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah Ben. So it's, I'm not the. But there you okay, go. We'll, we'll practice it for next time. Thank you very much, James. See you soon. Bye. Bye bye.